today we want to talk about peace on earth. How do we get there from where we are to this place of no more night? If you were to see the earth from space, you'd likely look down on the planet and think that everything was well. Before I go any further, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, would you just please be with us right now as we open your word. Let your spirit speak to us. Let us hear your voice, not the voice of any man. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Astronaut Scott Kelly, he just finished a historic year in space. One-time commander of the International Space Station said this. He says, we have a unique vantage point here aboard the International Space Station. As I look out the window, I see a very beautiful planet that seems very inviting and peaceful. Unfortunately, it is not. He was right about that. The planet isn't peaceful at all. There is war and trouble, and strife, and unrest. Everywhere you turn, there is a stunning lack of peace on earth. With daily news reports about the nuclear threat from North Korea, the actions of groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram, atrocities occurring in Syria, Afghanistan, and the United States of America, it isn't difficult to see the catastrophic state that this world is in. Closer home, Charleston, South Carolina, worshipers went to church for a midweek prayer meeting. And while they were there worshiping God, in a place where they had the right to expect to be safe, a deranged individual ended innocent lives brutally and tragically. Now we add Las Vegas to the unending list of mass murder in this country. And we wonder, how in the world could this even be possible? Peace on earth. How could it happen? However, when we look in the book of Revelation, we see what may sound like a contradiction. John begins the book of Revelation by wishing peace to the seven churches There are 19 books in the New Testament alone where the writer begins by wishing peace to his readers. The Bible refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. And yet, and yet despite our enlightened minds, technological advances, the wisdom that we have accrued from looking back over centuries of strife and turmoil and bloodshed, you would think we would learn. But in spite of what you would hope would be a drive towards self-preservation, we live in a world that is teetering on the precipice of tragedy. It doesn't make sense. But this is where we find ourselves. For years, the official policy of this world's superpowers was something called mutually assured destruction. Now, the idea of that is this. If they fire at us, before their missiles land, we'll fire at them. If they try to take us out, we'll take them out, and both nations would be obliterated. So, that which ensured peace was the assurance that if one nation did something irresponsible, both nations would suffer the consequences, right? So there was peace, a stalemate, if you were, a no-win scenario that no one wants to initiate because no one wins. So an enforced peace, mutually assured destruction. Then on a personal level, there's a stunning lack of personal peace. It seems like we just don't have enough time to do what we want to do. We're stressed out about everything, right? We're stressed out now about what goes on um, not only 
in Syria or Afghanistan, but stressed out about what happens right here at home, stressed out about what happens in our schools or colleges or universities, what happens in our houses of worship, what happens on our workplace. We're stressed out about everything. We're the most stressed people who have ever lived. And increasingly, younger and younger people are showing up with mental illness caused by stress-related diseases. You have more and more children medicated um, for things like depression and bipolar. You have children in kindergarten showing up to school, needing medication just so they can get through their day, stressed out about everything. So how in the world do we get back to a place of peace? When we look at the Bible, we see that God does have a peace plan for the world. Psalms 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have those who do what? Love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. The old King James says, and nothing shall offend them. God assures us peace is possible. But more than that, peace will be a reality in the lives of a certain group of people. Now, who are they? They are those who love God's law. Something happens when you and God are on the same wavelength, (laughs) when you're on the same page, so to speak. Here we're told that peace and assurance will flood your life. That is a promise. It doesn't necessarily mean that all your troubles are going to vanish, but to be at one with God. To be in harmony with him brings peace. You can have peace even if your life is hectic. And God's last day gospel message reinforces this idea. Revelation 14 verse 12. If you are using your seminar Bible and uh, every night uh, we offer these seminar Bibles to those who come and may not have brought their own. So if you're looking in the seminar Bible for Revelation 14 verse 12, you're looking at page 1184, page 1184 in the seminar Bible. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the last days of earth's history, there will be a group of saved people described as having faith in Jesus Christ and keeping the commandments of God. Those are the two characteristics of the people who stand at the last day for God. Now, what if, imagine, everybody chose to be like the people described here? Would society be better off? Yes or no? What would happen to the crime rate and murder statistics, right? This nation has a fraction of the world's population, but a quarter of the world's population in prison. A full quarter of the population in prison. Something's wrong. Somewhere we're missing the boat. Looking towards the, uh, the world's last days, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound, the correlation to that is that the love of many would grow cold. Now think about some of these things we just talked about, whether it was in Charleston, South Carolina, or whether it was in Las Vegas, or whether it was in Orlando, Florida, at the Pulse nightclub. In order for you to be that cold, right? Cold-blooded murder. There has to be in your heart lawlessness, right? A complete disregard for not only the laws of man, but the laws of God. 
complete lawlessness, and Jesus pointed it out. The two would be tied together. Because lawlessness would abound, then the love of many would grow cold. That's what you have. When you cast out the law of God, what you have in its place is cold-bloodedness. No restraint against one's passions, their rage, their anger. They take things into their own hand. Paul said in the last days, perilous times would come. And now throughout the world, we see hideous crimes of a shocking nature. We see a disregard for life, a callousness, a coldness that we didn't see yesterday quite like we do today. Why would this be? Well, again, Revelation tells us. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Notice what John wrote here. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having what? Great wrath. Because he knows that he has a short time. Every day that passes by is one day less that the devil has to work his works. And so he works with increasing fury, with rapid intensification to spread his woe and misery and distraction and destruction. Writing in Revelation, John talked about a power described by the Apostle Paul as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Watch that correlation. The man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Daniel wrote about this same power that would think to change times and laws. So not only is there an attempt to disregard God's law, but there is an attempt on the part of the man of sin, the lawless one, to change, to alter, to manipulate God's law. According to the Bible, a hallmark of earth's last days will be a massive disregard for law and authority. In particular, a disregard for the law of God. There's no denying that. There's no denying that, generally speaking, our standards have plummeted downwards as a society and we have turned our backs on God's standards for living. How do you protect? How do you protect your children? How do you protect moral values in an immoral world? How do you raise your kids in a society where they are constantly exposed to things we barely saw or knew about a generation ago? How do we hope for a future where our children can be morally upright when morality, immorality is pushed in their faces from everywhere they look? I remember... As a kid, and many of you will remember, too, how you could ride your bike in your neighborhood unsupervised. I do. I, we would spend long summers with my aunt. And me and my first cousin, we would go, you know, go outside and play. You guys aren't going to sit in the house all day and just watch TV. Go out and play. And so the kids, we would go out. And what would we do? Skateboard ride our bike, and we had the run of the neighborhood. And we didn't have any adult watching us as we went. And that was freedom as a kid. I remember that. You wouldn't think of doing that today. You don't let your children out of your sight for a moment. Things have changed so much. How do we get to the place where we can have a peaceful world and peace in our hearts? God has a plan, and he outlines it in the book of Revelation. Again, we pick this up in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. So now we're on page 1183 in the Seminar Bible. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who are on the earth, right? To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. 
Okay? And then immediately following this, we see in verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. After God had led his people out of Egypt, he wrote out Ten Commandments. He wrote them on stone, indicating that they were to endure. Interestingly enough, they were not just written on any stone. They were written on sapphire, which is a blue stone. Blue representing loyalty. Loyalty, And when you see blue in the sanctuary, the color blue described in the elements, you are talking about loyalty to the law of God. Bluestone. These were not new principles, okay? God said Abraham kept his commandments. The Ten Commandments weren't New, but God wrote them down for Israel and he wrote them down for us. So, are the Ten Commandments a good idea or not? First commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, now that seems like a reasonable request. This is the creator, the almighty God. Don't have any gods besides me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. God knew that images and idols actually lower our conception of who God is and reduce the creator to the creature. Why would we make images to a, to a cow, you know, or, or a horse or a pig when those are created things instead of the creator himself? Third commandment says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This protects our relationship with God. God remains holy in our thinking and in our practice. We don't denigrate or belittle God by reverencing his name, that name that is above all names. Commandment four, keep the Sabbath holy. Remember to keep that day holy. We'll talk about this one more in detail tonight. So you got to come back tonight if you want to hear more about commandment number four. Commandment five, honor your father and your mother. God wants to protect the family and society. For all of society's ills and everything that we're trying to do to repair and rebuild society at its basic fundamental building block, God had a commandment in place to protect Society and the family. Honor your father and your mother. The first commandment with a promise. Number six, you shall not murder. That one goes without saying. How that would change the landscape of our country and the world if we respected life. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery and take something that is not your own. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. Again, you shall not take something that does not belong to you. Commandment nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That means lies, falsehood, slander. You don't make up fake news (laughs) against somebody else. Tell the truth. The tenth commandment is often forgotten. You shall not covet. You shall not lust and desire for something that somebody else has because that ultimately is going to give way to theft. And ultimately, you will have to lie to cover your theft. And ultimately, it may lead you to murder to cover your lie, to cover your theft because you coveted. You wanted something that was not yours and that thing that you coveted, you put before God, you had another God other than the true and living God. They're all connected. They're all connected. Now, can you find, even among one of the Ten Commandments, one that you would argue with? One that you could say, we could do without. That one's not really necessary. Anyone can agree that these are good principles, good for any society. 
There's good sense in keeping them. And when you start breaking them, right, you start to lose that sense of personal peace. Because your violation against somebody else affects the peace of me, right? If somebody breaks into the house of my neighbor and steals something that belongs to them, my peace is affected because now I'm worried about my belongings. Isn't that right? Okay, and so on and so forth. Uh, everything, no man is an island. Each of us is, is connected together and what affects one affects the other. Ultimately, we're all impacted. We lose our sense of personal peace when we begin breaking these commandments. When folks lie to you, you can't trust them. When there's violence, you live in fear. When there's dishonor among people where there ought to be honor, there's fragmentation and dissonance in a family. If we have another God in place of the true God, it's not possible then to have a faith relationship with the Creator. When we start to want things that we shouldn't have, life isn't right side up anymore. God gave us the Ten Commandments because they're good for us, because they work. And when you violate them, you begin to experience guilt and doubt and shame and alienation, stress, discord, and disconnection. But when you live in harmony with God's principles, there's harmony between you and God and there's harmony between one human being and another. The Ten Commandments are perfectly balanced. The first four, honor God. The last six, honor your fellow man. Keep those in balance and you can have peace. The Bible makes clear that God's law plays an important role in society and an important role in heaven's final judgment. Uh, James chapter 2 and verse 12, I won't put it on the screen. It says, so speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The law of liberty. The Bible calls God's law a law of liberty. And when you live in harmony with God's law, you're free from guilt, free from shame, and free from condemnation, free from the ill feelings that we have toward another person. God's law is a law of freedom, and only the enemy could be so clever as to take something meant for our freedom and turn it into bondage. Why would you want to live under God's law? You're free. You're a free moral agent. You can do what you want to do. Nobody has to tell you what to do. That's what Lucifer came at the angels with, right? You're angels. You're angels for goodness sake. Why do you need to live under God's law? He's bound you up. You need to be free. Cast that off. And when they cast that off, they came into what? Lawlessness. And when they came into lawlessness, their love died. And there was strife. And there was war in heaven. And there was violence. And now we see the result of lawlessness in full flower here on planet earth. We live with it every day. In heaven's judgment, harmony with God's law means freedom from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who be in Christ Jesus. But what if you find yourself outside of God's will and you don't want to change? You don't want to live in reference to God. How can sinful people learn to live God's way? Well, legislating doesn't change the human heart, right? You can make all kinds of written laws. That's not going to change human behavior. So how then do we come into harmony with law that we find ourselves naturally opposed to. Well, look at what David said in Psalm 40 and verse 8. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is where? Within my heart. When God writes his law, not in stone now, but in your heart, you won't only know what you ought to do, but you'll want to do it. <laughs> that's, that's flipping the script. Not only do you have a knowledge of what you should do, but you want to do it. You want to live in harmony with God's principles. The Bible describes this as the new covenant experience. God says, I'll take my law and I'll put it in your mind and write it on 
your heart. It has to come at your consent, though. With your consent, I will do that. Now, there are some people who know God's will, but don't have any interest at all in following it. Then there are some who want to do it, but they don't have the strength to do it. They find themselves weak in the flesh. Paul talked about that in Romans 7, right? The man who says, for I, what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. But when God writes his law in your heart, you'll not only know it, but you'll want God's will done in your life. The Ten Commandments simply act as a protection around, around you and your family. God makes us free through Jesus and then he wants us, he wants to keep us free. Okay? And notice what always comes first. Don't forget this. Freedom from oppression, freedom from sin comes first. Then God gives us his law to show us how to live as free people. Look at the children of Israel in Egypt, which came first. The Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai or deliverance from Pharaoh and his army at the Red Sea. Deliverance came first. Once they passed through and were on the other side, they passed through the waters of baptism in the Red Sea. And once they were on the other side, they emerged a free nation. They were free. Pharaoh and his army was dead. They were done. They were free people. But now, how do free people live? These were slaves. They only knew how to follow orders. How do free people live in harmony with God? Now God takes them to Sinai. And he gives free people his law. Not to bind them up again but to show them how they can stay free. You want to stay free? Then follow my law, which is the law of liberty, the law of love. It'll protect you. It'll protect your family. It'll protect society. And you will ride on the high places of the earth. You will be free as no one has known freedom. Deliverance always comes first. Look at how Jesus related to this in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. He says, Do not think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, that's one dot of an eye, one stroke of a, of, of a T, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus was very strong on this. He did not want to see God's law changed or harmed in any way. Why would he? It's the law of liberty. It's how free people that he's going to set free remain free. So he was very strong. No, nothing changes. But some interpret the word fulfill, many Christians interpret the word fulfill as to mean done away with. Well, now let's put that in the text and see if it makes sense. I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or uh, one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is done away with. Or let's back up and put it in the first part of that verse do not think that i came to destroy the law of the prophets i did not come to destroy but to do away with does that make sense now don't think i came to destroy the law of the prophets no i didn't come to destroy them i came to um i came to do away with them what that's that's double speak that's that's alternative facts <laughs> Okay? That's not the meaning of the word fulfill. It means to what? To complete, to magnify, to fully develop so that you could see the richness and the fullness of what the law really means, to amplify. Okay? Jesus didn't come to change the law. He came to change our hearts. That's what Jesus came into the world to do. God's law does several things. 
It's to show us, number one, what God is like. It's a revelation of his character. The laws of a land will tell you a lot about who's in charge of the land. The laws are a reflection of the law giver. God's law is a transcript of his character. Secondly, it shows us what sin is. Romans 3 verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Okay, keep that in mind. For by the law is what? Knowledge of sin. Okay, again, this is sometimes where Christians, we get it wrong. Because sometimes our approach to the law is that law is there for us to receive justification by it. In other words, by keeping the law, we're saved. Okay, let's go back to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Which came first, deliverance or the law? Deliverance. They were saved, right? They were free people. All right, now imagine they start keeping the law in order to be saved. But they're already saved. Right? So you're not keeping the law for justification of something. Jesus provides justification through his shed blood on the cross. Okay? No, no. By the law is knowledge of sin. It's how we know we're off track. It's how we know that we're living under bondage and not living in the freedom of that Christ died to give us. The law says, "Uh uh-uh, you're going back under bondage. You're living like Egyptians again. You're not Egyptians. You're a child of God. This is how you live. This is how you live in freedom. See, that's what the law does. It shows us where we are off. Now, you remember some years ago, there was no speed limit and by the way in montana romans 4 15 says for where there is no law there is no transgression right so if there's no law no transgression there was no speed limit during the daytime you see what that says there it says daytime rational what does it say reasonable and prudent <laughs> reasonable and prudent all right for trucks it's a little bit different okay But there was no limit. So if you wanted to drive 90 miles an hour in Montana, you wouldn't worry about being pulled over by the state trooper and flagged down for uh, for getting a ticket because, of course, there's no transgression. There's nothing there. The law said you could drive as fast as you wanted considering the driving conditions. The Bible says where there's no law, there's no transgression. In Montana, it wasn't illegal to drive 90 miles on the freeway as long as the roads were good therefore no transgression however on the other hand first john chapter 3 verse 4 says that sin is lawlessness it is transgression it is lawlessness the existence of sin demonstrates listen the existence of sin demonstrates the existence of god's law There can be no such thing as sin without it. And if the law is done away with, listen to me. If the law is done away with, why are Christians in churches all over the world still preaching about sin and transgression? It's like having no speed limit in Montana. How how can I preach about transgression and sin? That only exists if the law is in effect. So it is a contradiction of the worst kind to say that the law has been done away with and still stand up and preach, you need to come to Jesus to get forgiveness for your sin. The existence of sin shows that there is existence of God's law. We can't talk about transgression if there is no law. Now, a good question to ask ourselves is this well which laws of God are still in effect because in the Bible you'll find the moral law the Ten Commandments and then you'll find the ceremonial law of Moses that's right ceremonial law of Moses has feast days animal sacrifices and so forth they're different they were both given by God 
But look at this and you'll see a real difference. Deuteronomy chapter 10 tells us that the moral law, God's law, was written by God, right? It was written on tables of stone, blue stone. And it was put inside the Ark of the Covenant. That's significant, it's placement. Because the Ark of the Covenant is in the most holy place, representing the very throne room of God. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God. Where God's presence was. You remember there were two covering cherub on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. With angels, right? Covering cherubs. Their wings touching over the top. And between those two angels was the Shekinah glory of God. The radiance, the brilliance, the rhema of his presence. You couldn't go in there. Only the high priest can go in there. Once a year on the Day of Atonement with blood. If there's anything wrong, he's not coming out of there alive. This is a holy God. Okay? It is significant that underneath this, inside the box, is the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments represents the foundation of God's government. It is the seat of of his authority, the explanation of his character. It's how his kingdom runs. The Ten Commandments is actually in the throne of God. But what's even better news than that (laughs) is that above the Ten Commandments, the lid on top of the ark is called what? The mercy seat. Which means that even though the law is the foundation of God's government, we should take it seriously. Grace (laughs) is above the law. It gives you and me, sinners, the opportunity to come boldly before the throne of grace. Because God extends his mercy to those who are learning to walk in the freedom of his commandments. Amen. God's law, written by God, written on tables of stone, placed within the Ark of the Covenant. In contrast, Moses' law, we call it Moses' law, it's still God's law, but it was written by the hand of Moses. The ceremonial law was written by Moses. It was written in a book, not on stone, and it was put in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Not foundational to the throne of God and his government. It was put in the side. It had a time and it had a place. But those laws were not to be enduring. Those laws dealt with ordinances, new moons, feast days, sacrifices. The moral law, the Ten Commandments, contains the thou shalt nots, which really, if you read them properly, are really thou shalt. They are really promises. If you put God first and have no other gods before me, guess what? You won't lie. (laughs) You won't commit adultery. You won't murder. You won't steal. You'll honor your father and mother. You won't covet. You won't bear false witness. That's a promise. Those are ten promises. It's not thou shalt not. It's you, you won't. You won't do these things because my law is in your heart. There's a difference between these two laws. Both were given by God, but given for very different reasons. A natural question that might be, are we supposed to be keeping any of the Jewish feasts today? That's a big discussion among some people. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements or ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Oh, there is something nailed to the cross. Notice this. In another version, you'll find that it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That's King James. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. So whatever this was, this handwriting of ordinances, it was nailed to the cross. The very next verse says this. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, so, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon 
or Sabbaths, plural, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. Now, something was blotted out. If you're going to assume that the Ten Commandments were blotted out, then you're assuming that thou shalt not kill doesn't matter anymore. Go ahead. Be careful with that. If you start assuming that the Ten Commandments was blotted out, you've got some problems. However, it says, let no one judge you in food or in meat or drink. In the sanctuary services, the round of rituals connected to the temple and the, and the sanctuary, there were meat and drink offerings. Or regarding a festival or a new moon, these also were part of the ceremonies, part of the annual year of the seven holy feasts, and these things were guided by new moons and so on. Then it says, or on the Sabbath days. Now, the Ten Commandments does talk about the Sabbath day. But these Sabbath days here are described as what? A shadow of things to come. The weekly Seventh Day Sabbath in the Ten Commandments wasn't a shadow of anything to come. That was a present day reality that was founded at creation before sin came. You see, until sin came, you didn't need sacrifices. You didn't need sacrifices. You didn't need festivals. You didn't need Passover. You didn't need any of those things. Those were added after sin, what? To point us back to God, to get us back in relationship with him. And they were fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. But the seventh day Sabbath, which is a memorial of creation, we're going to talk about this more tonight, that was established before sin. Before symbols and rituals and things pointing to what Jesus would come to do, that was a part of God's original design for planet Earth. So it's not included in this list of things that are shadows of things to come. It's very different. The Passover is a very classic example. It pointed forward to Jesus' coming. The angel passed over the homes of those who had put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts during the first Passover in Egypt, and they were saved. We're saved when the blood of Jesus is on the doorposts of our hearts. When God looks upon us and he sees Jesus' blood in our place because we've accepted his sacrifice by faith, Christ dying for our sins, that salvation is within us. Now today, do we need to offer animal sacrifices anymore? If we did... If we did, what would that be saying about Jesus' sacrifice? It's not enough. It's not worth it. It's no good. We're still needing to kill lambs. You'd actually be denying Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, you remember God caused the veil in the temple to tear from top to bottom. The sanctuary services were over they were finished john the baptist said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world he is the true lamb the ceremonies the feast days and the sacrifices are now obsolete but honor thy father and thy mother thou shalt not commit adultery don't make any graven images and bow down to them those are still in effect today that's how free people saved by the blood of jesus live and the wages of sin is death So what can we do? Because we've broken the Ten Commandments, haven't we? What can we do? Where's the hope for sinners? Well, look at this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Imagine the love in the heart of God. God says, confess your sins and I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you. Isaiah wrote, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, right, they'll be white as snow we recognize that we're sinners we believe that jesus died to save us we confess our sins and we believe that salvation is ours as a gift we do we believe that we believe it because god said so that's what faith is faith is simply 
believing that something is so because God said it, and it is so. It's all God's responsibility. He says you're forgiven, child of God. Do you believe it? Do you want to have it? Salvation is a gift. Never forget that. It is a gift. There was nothing that Israel could do to save themselves from Pharaoh and his army. There was nothing they could do about that. They were at the mercy of Pharaoh. God had to take divine action and save his people, take them through to safety and save them. It was his action. It was a gift. And salvation is always a gift, my friends. Never get it confused. Never think that your law-keeping earns you something that Jesus' death purchased for you. Your law-keeping is simply a loving response to what God has already done. It shows me how I am to live as a free child of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what this verse tells us is that sin destroys us, but God saves us. God doesn't have to do that for us, but he does it anyway. That's grace. Psalms 40 and verse 8. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. Some people will say, well, I don't believe we're under the law anymore. Well, hallelujah. We don't believe we're under the law either. (laughs) We're under grace. When you're a lost sinner, you're under the law. You don't know. You're still condemned. You don't know that you're free. If you're trying to get to heaven without relying on Jesus, you're under the law. That is, you're under its penalty for having broken the law. But when you come to Christ and he extends forgiveness to you, he's saying, I take away that penalty. I'm offering you salvation. It kind of works like this. Um, John Bradshaw, preacher for It Is Written, recalls this story. He says he was driving home following a seminar presentation just like this. And I'm quoting him now. He says, as I was driving down an old country road with no cars around, I saw some blue lights flashing behind me. I began to think to myself, "Uh uh-oh, I wonder what I've done. The policeman pulled him over and said, are you late for something? And I said very sincerely, no, sir. I'm not late for anything. Then why are you going over the speed limit? Now, I looked at him, and you would think I was auditioning for an acting role. But I said, I was. He said, you didn't see the sign back there? And I said, sign? No, sir. What sign? It's important to tell the truth. I hadn't seen the sign. I'd only driven down that road six or seven times. I never knew there was a sign there, but it's my responsibility to know. I gave him my driver's license, and I said, I'm sorry. I was just going too fast. I'm I'm really sorry about that. He took my driver's license back to his car and gave me time to pray. So I prayed. I hung my head in that car and I said, Lord, I am so sorry about this. Because if you had to pay a fine, honestly, that's God's money you're filtering away. It's not smart to do that, I said. But Lord, if you could get me out of this, I would really appreciate it. But then I said, but if not, Lord, I understand I'm guilty. It's not your fault. It's mine. So whatever will be, will be. But that's my prayer. The officer came back and he put a piece of paper in my hand. On the top, it said, courtesy notice. And he checked where it said, speeding, driving less than five miles per hour over the speed limit. I was so happy. And then he said, if I catch you speeding around here again, you'll really get it next time. And I said, officer, you can be sure you will not catch me speeding around here again. And I meant it. I'm still quoting him. Now, when he stopped me and I was going too fast, what was I under? I was under the law. When he gave me that courtesy notice, I was then what? Under grace. Because I was under grace, I dropped the clutch, spun my wheels, and drove 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour down the main street of town, right? No. I was under grace. 
I made sure my seat belt was on. I adjusted the mirror. I turned on my turn signal, looked over my shoulder, pulled out, and I didn't get above 33 miles an hour driving down the road. I was under grace. Right? Grace doesn't give you license to break God's law. It makes you grateful for the mercy that was shown. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. It's a whole lot of people claiming to love God. And God says that love for me will be manifested in keeping my commandments. This is my will for you. It's his will for each one of us. I pray, my prayer for you is that you will say to God, I want that grace. I want the peace that comes from obeying your law. I want to be a part of that group at the end of time that stands up, that keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus because of your grace at work in my life. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the fact that you sit above the mercy seat. We are all law breakers. There's not one of those commandments that we have not fallen short. All fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, we come to you this morning not on the basis of how good we have kept the laws. We don't come to you on the basis of how faithful we have been. It's obvious we have not been faithful. We come to you on the basis of how faithful Jesus is. He is the faithful one. And he has taken our penalty to Calvary and paid for it with his blood. And he offers us the opportunity by faith to receive that deliverance so that he can then, as free people, write on our hearts and on our minds your law so that we can live and walk in peace. Help us, Father, to never get it backwards and to walk in the peace that you offer us every single day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.